Hey, it's Zoe, and welcome to the last day of November when I'm recording this, and when you're listening to it, welcome to that day. Today, we are talking about moving the dial 1%, specifically in your habits and in your meetings. Okay, let's go. Welcome to the Zoe Ralph Leadership Podcast, your source of strategies and insights to make you a better leader. Influence, improve, inspire. This is episode 97. (laughs) When I started doing this podcast, I didn't really have an end point in mind. And bang, before you know it, we're at at episode number 97, almost 100. So that means I'm going to do something special in episode 100. I'm pretty sure it's going to involve a giveaway. And you're going to have to stay tuned for that. Of course, we have three more weeks before that happens. So it may be either right before Christmas or in the new year. So it'll depend on my publishing schedule. I like to finish things well-rounded, so heads up, it's likely going to be before I hop on a plane to go overseas on the 20th of December. In that case, make sure you do tune in to episode 100 and all the other good stuff in between, because I'm going to give you a chance, and whoever emails me will get a chance to get the giveaway. Uh, And it's not like you go into the lottery thing. Everyone wins a prize on this one. So I'm committed to you. If you're committed to me and you're enjoying the podcast, episode 100 is going to be a hoot and something special for you. So let's talk about what's special for you today. Moving the dial 1%. This was in James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, and that's the whole point of it. If you just tweak something a little bit, 1% over repeated consistently adds up to a significant change. Which is a good thing, because I promised to report in on my experiment of becoming a corporate athlete and the changes I wanted to make, specifically in relation to my sleep habits. And it was all going swimmingly until (laughs) I got derailed, of course, because I didn't plan for some things. So when you're at home and in your regular routine, I found I could follow my intentions quite well. The alarms worked, I was in bed and I wasn't veering off the path at all of my sleep habits. When I went to, where the hell was I? Yes, last week I was in Melbourne for Thought Leaders Business School Immersion. And of course, a disruption of of routine. So I'm starting the day differently. I'm ending the day differently. There's social activities. And I got derailed. It almost started when my friend, Oscar Chimboli, God bless his cotton socks, came up to me because he's also part of the business school. And he said to me, so how's the corporate athlete thing going? I'm like, yes, it's going very well. Thank you. And he said, are you having some of the cake that's on offer today? (laughs) And he had me at cake and I love sweet stuff. So I checked in with the maker of the cake, Stephen Scott Johnson, and it ticked all the boxes. So I passed that test. It was a gluten-free, sugar-free, beautiful, healthy, dark, rich chocolate cake made out of almonds and oranges. So, yep, (laughs) permission to have the cake, not permission to have two servings, which I didn't have. So that was almost the derailer. It didn't last very long, though, because that night at dinner, I had not planned for Social Zoe to take over corporate athlete Zoe. (laughs) And Social Zoe decides that she likes to be in with the crowd and have a drink. So I had a drink and that was my little derailer. Didn't sleep well. My body doesn't process alcohol very well. Didn't sleep well and things had a knock-on effect after that. (sighs) Sigh. So what is one to do? I pulled out James Clear's book and went back to the source and said, all right, what needs to change in order to get back on track? So the first thing is that the corporate athlete identity is likely not cemented effectively yet. So how do you do that? He says, get clear on what that identity looks like. So by looking to someone who is a corporate athlete, in my mind, what are their habits? What, what do they do? Or just imagining what that would look like, being really clear on that. And then celebrating with small wins. I was having small wins, but I wasn't celebrating them. So to dial this up, I'm going to use my journal to celebrate the small wins. So I could have, retrospectively thinking about it, in that challenge of mm, cake, celebrated the the small win, which was I evaluated the contents of the cake and found them to be acceptable and then made a conscious decision to eat it. (laughs) That, That is a small win that I am claiming for myself. The next small win is that I uh, feel that um, the next small win was 
<clears throat> that I did not drink for the remainder of my time away, which is a small win. So there you go. I could have put that into my journal. No problem. Okay. So the other big guns I want to pull out for cementing the identity is including visual cues and reminders. So if I'm going to really move into this new skin of being a corporate athlete, I need to have, I'm going to do these things. I'm going to add affirmations to my reminders on my phone. So they pop up and remind me that I am this thing. I am a corporate athlete. I'm going to have pictures of, of me looking corporate athlete, like (laughs) healthy and fit around me. So it becomes more visible to me in terms of those cues. And then I'm going to have to take radical intervention and actually move the iPad and the iPhone out of the bedroom, like I said I would, but haven't yet, and restrict access. I haven't bought the Kindle as as a single-use device. I got pushback on that from Rob. He's like, ah, waste of money, extra device. And my ecological self wasn't really happy about having two devices either. So removing the device from the bedroom is the next best move. Okay, my aura ring is on its way. So my sleep tracker is on its way. I have followed through on that. Okay, just that was my accountability piece. I hope you're learning from my experimentation and that you too are applying applying experiments to your life. 1%, it doesn't have to be a, a revolution. It just needs to be an inch forward, which is cool. So the other 1% dial I want to bring your attention to is the 25-minute meeting. Thanks to Donna McGeorge, this is her new book, The 25-Minute Meeting, Half the Time, Double the Impact. And I went through Donna's book this morning, and it didn't take me long to read. It's just, it's set out so beautifully, it's easy to absorb, and it's got some powerful insights in it that I thought were worth uh, highlighting for you because... I like this idea of a 25-minute meeting. I think in applying that to my coaching, I'm not sure. All my coaching sessions are an hour long, um, so they don't necessarily fit into that. But I'm curious about reducing my coaching meetings to 45 minutes or even maybe half an hour because I reckon if you have a container or constraint around your time, you get super focused. And that was sort of Donna's principle around the 25 minute meeting is that we fluff away our time with waiting for people or being too social or being allowing waffle. And I reckon if we put a, put a container around it, we will get laser sharp focus. I'm really passionately interested about this too, because what I found with my clients is that time is the most important currency that they, that they have to spend. And making conscious decisions about how they spend their time is becoming more and more of an imperative. And you know that to be true, too. It's funny, you know, thinking back on the evolution of technology in human society, we thought as soon as we got electricity and things like electric blenders and bread makers that we would have all this leisure time. Who has leisure time? (laughs) No, we have not become a society of people who are basking in leisure. We have become a society that works, 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 and works again. And so time is our most precious commodity. So if we think about our time as something that we can spend consciously, then we have an opportunity to make the most of our activities in the containers of time that we allocate them. So on to Donna's book. I recommend it. Thumbs up. I reckon there's something useful in it for everybody who is a participant in meetings or runs meetings. And you will get far more productive outcomes in less time as a result. Here are the things that I found that are going to help me. So here's her first tip, which is not a new one. Have an agenda. Duh. (laughs) That's like basic meeting 101. Is it easy to just move into bad habits around this? Yes, it is. And I've been noticing this in the meetings with my team, how lazy I have become in not having agendas that are purposeful. So make sure you have a clear agenda and what the purpose of the meeting is and who should be there. Donna says no more than five people in a meeting and no more than three agenda items. Mm -hmm. And this is specifically related to business as usual meetings, not big strategy meetings or not other types of meetings like two-day retreats, but business as usual, we need to meet to make decisions about how we're going to progress our work. Three agenda items, five people, 25 minutes is the formula. 
Now, after the agenda, this is the part that I really like is, okay, so you have an agenda item, which is, so say, for example, we're going to be talking about how to progress our SEO project. So we're working on an SEO project for our website. We've got a massive list of tasks from an audit that we had done. How are we going to progress this? Who's going to be doing it? So the next part is adding a process to that agenda item. So if I was smart, (laughs) I would actually set out the process for that. I'm smart. I'm going to do this audibly now before our meeting later on today. So our process will be, okay, SEO items is itemize the items that are remaining on the project, approximate how much time it would take to complete these, identify any barriers that are in place that, for example, missing information or we need a process or a step-by-step instruction around this, and then allocate people and allocate a deadline for it. And that's that's the way we're going to progress on this stuff because it's an important piece of work. It's just not urgent. So that's how we're going to do that. So adding a process, breaking down your agenda item into, right, how we're actually going to discuss and decide is the critical piece that we need to do before we get to a meeting so we don't just go round and round and and expect people to toss ideas on the table. So one of her her process for the 25 minutes is scan, assess, and context. Scan, sorry, scan, focus, and act. Scan takes 12 minutes, focus takes eight, and act takes five. That's your 25 minutes. Specifically, scan is about assessing the context of the meeting or the agenda items. So you take 12 12 minutes to scope out, do we have all the right information for this? Focus is then making the decisions. And you might use a criteria, a matrix of criteria, or you might use voting cards. And then act is allocating. It's using the five W's, who, what, when, where, why. There you go. It's documented. It's done. You're out of there. Isn't that cool? (laughs) It doesn't have to be so belabored. And I think if we paid attention to this, we would harvest back all this time that we're frittering away. The last part of the book is adding variety to your meetings. She's got three ones that I think were really useful for me, standing meetings, walking meetings, and visual recording. So I've been working on my visual recording skills ever since I attended uh, Lynn Kazali's facilitation program a couple weeks ago. And that means when you write up on the whiteboard, uh, items or you draw a picture of what you're going to do, you actually use figurines or symbols to represent the action. Why do this? You do this because your brain processes it, processes it much more quickly. I didn't know that. So she's got an example in here. Um, I'm not going to be able to find it in a couple minutes, but she draws something and then she puts right next to it the words that it represents. And your brain gets the image far more quickly than the words. Who knew? I'm such, a, I'm such a verbal person myself. I'm a keen writer. And adding visual language into my meetings to help people capture and remember things better. Ace. Meetings just got a whole bunch better. All right. So that's my 1% tips of the day. A little bit of a review on how to build identity and to don't worry about not getting it perfect the first time from James Clear's Atomic Habits. And the thumbs up book review for Donna McGeorge's 25-minute meeting. And this will be in the show notes at zoyrouth.com slash podcast slash move the dial. Move the dial. Okay, that's it from me. I hope you have a brilliant day, evening, or afternoon, wherever it is for you in, in the world. In the meantime, live well, lead well. <laughs>